And uh, once we get to that place, just um, just hold your Bible right there in your lap. If uh, any of y'all have heard me before, we're going to be using our Bible a good bit tonight. So uh, keep it close, keep it handy. We're going to be taking quite the journey. Talking about the Lord protecting us and uh, on that category. Um, my dad has a rule for all of us land boys. If, um, and this is, this is the rule. If there's ever a snake around, it's actually more a law. Uh, if there is a snake around within a certain amount of uh, feet away from us, probably a good hundred feet in each direction from us, if it's anywhere in that radius, it'll, it'll come and find us. So, um, what was it? It was probably, it was sometime this weekend. Um, we're getting ready for bed. It's about 10 o'clock, and uh, all of a sudden, the dogs go berserk. And it's never a good thing at that late at night if the dogs go berserk. So, uh, of course, Mama tells me, peep outside. Daddy's already upstairs, uh, ups, upstairs getting a shower or whatever. So, of course, I peep out the door and get right down there on our front step because we got the overhang of the oak trees shining the light around, seeing what I can see. I expect a deer. Uh, for some reason, some, some way or another, as soon as I hit that top step, something caught something out of the corner of my eye. I shined down right there on the, uh, right beside the front uh, steps of our porch to see a nice long copperhead. So, of course, I go crazy because the dog is all around. It is going berserk, making all kinds of noise. And uh, so I go berserk. I go running inside. Of course, uh, I have a younger brother, so uh, I'm not allowed to keep shells with the shotgun in my room. So... I'm hollering at Brian to grab his shotgun because he can have shells in his room. So uh, we get outside finally with the gun, and uh, Brian goes to go shoot it. And for those of you that's been at our house, uh, we have two stones right there on either side of our uh, porch, and they're pretty good size. And, of course, it's curled up, ready to strike right there against that rock. So Mama comes around and outside, whoa, 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 what do you think you're doing? You ain't shooting right there. My car's right there. <laughs> Wasn't worried about the snake that was sitting right there within five feet from us, but worried about her front of her car getting shot up with rock, or pellets. So needless to say, the Lord, the Lord is really, y'all say, uh, y'all talking about the Lord protecting you. I know how that feels already, 16 years. I should be dead right now. Uh, my parents put it this way. I've probably worn out at least three or four guardian angels already, if you believe in those. <laughs> So anyway, uh, let's get started with what the Lord has for us tonight. I, uh, I burned enough time, and uh, so let's just get to it. First uh, Peter chapter number one, verse number thirteen is where we'll begin reading. The Bible says, "Wherefore gird up your loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought to you unto uh, brought to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ." As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust of your, in, your ignorance, but as he hath called you to be holy. And so be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, do you thank you for today to give us, Lord. Thank you for keeping us safe today, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to be in church, Lord, to preach the word of God. Lord, I ask you to help us now to take this time. And use it wisely, Lord. Help us not to uh, take it lightly, Lord. The responsibility that's laid upon us. Lord, help me to say everything that you'd have me to say and nothing more. Lord, ask you to help the listener as they're out there, Lord. Help me to speak clearly so they can understand it, so they can apply it to their lives. Be better Christians in service for you, Lord. Help me to help somebody, Lord. If I'm unable to help somebody, Lord, just help me to sit down and uh, help get somebody else up here who can. Lord, I long, to, I long to please you in these next few minutes, Lord. Help me to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. So this summer I uh, was the first summer that I actually had a, what you might call, job. Um, something that I went to every week uh, that gave money. So, um, and in that job description, every job has a job description. The job could, description could be, uh, anywhere from a few words to unlimited. Um, 
And my job description was kind of that unlimited part. I'm uh, helping a fella right up the road up here. And uh, he's in a wheelchair, so he can't do what he used to do. And he's got a bunch of flowers and plants and stuff like that. And um, so uh, I, I go out there and I help him. And that's my job. That's my job description. I go out there and whatever he tells me to do, whatever he needs me to do that day, whether it's pulling weeds out of a flower garden, out of a flower bed, whether it's... Uh, trimming up a tree or uh, whatever the case may be for that day. Uh, it's my job to do it. That's what he pays me to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, Mr. Brian here, he, he's a mechanic. That's his job description. His job description is to troubleshoot a car and whatever's wrong with it, do to the best of his ability to fix it. He hadn't had a whole lot of luck with Fords, but, you know, he's, he's still trying. He's trying. So I, I think you get the point of where I'm going here. Uh, each and every one of us as Christians have a job description. We have, a, a, based upon the Bible and the principles of the Bible and what God says and what God has called us to do, we have a job description, something that each and every one of us has been designed to do by God. So uh, with the Lord's help, uh, these next few minutes, that's what I'm going to be preaching about, that's what I'm going to be talking about and it's a very simple thought, but it's something that I believe we all need to be reminded of. The, just the simple basics, getting back to the principles of God's word, the job of a Christian. So we first here we see our calling. Our, uh, the first one here, our call to be holy. The Bible says right here in uh, 1 Peter 1.16, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The verse before that, uh, He hath called you to be holy. It's interesting, this word holy. I, I looked this up, and uh, so I was like, what exactly is the definition of this word holy? What, I, we, I've been in uh, church all my life, Sunday school, and I've heard this word holy my whole life, but I hadn't really got a, 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 a very direct definition of it, if you will. So uh, this word holy in uh, the tense that is used here is uh, dedicated or consecrated to God for his purpose. My mouth's getting dry already. <clears throat> so dedicated or consecrated to God for his purpose. Uh, like I said, everybody has a job description. Everybody has their own duty. The Bible says we are all part of a body. We are the body of Christ. Some could be the thumb. Some could be the finger. One could be the, uh, well, God, Christ is the head of the body. So uh, maybe one's an arm or a, a leg or something like that. And each one serves a different purpose, but we're all... We're all striving for the same goal, and that is to ultimately please our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So whatever your purpose is here tonight, maybe, maybe you're a Sunday school teacher, maybe you play the piano, maybe you lead the singing. If God has called you to do that, then let's, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's not reserve any of ourselves back, to him, uh, back from him, and I'm getting ahead of myself. But whatever God has called us to do, let's, uh, let's do it and be holy about it. Uh, there should be a fine line. Uh, there should be a difference between when someone looks at us and when somebody looks at somebody, a lost person. If they see no difference in us, then why, why would they see the need to be a Christian? If they see no difference in the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we walk, the way we go about our everyday lives, then why would they see a need for them? To, basically, what they're seeing is I got what they got in my condition right now. I can do pretty much anything I want to without having the guilt, without having the, uh, the conscience, or without having the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I can do anything I want to. I can go out in the world as a lost person, and I, have, I seem to have the same peace, the same joy, the same confidence that the saved person has. That shouldn't be so. We should, have, we should live a separated and a different life, one that upholds the standard of the Bible and one that uh, we have such a confidence in the Lord that when something does come up at work, when something doesn't go how exactly it's supposed to be planned, when, when there's a test that you bomb out on at school, just to have that confidence with the Lord's help, next time it won't be this way. Uh, see, anybody can go around and whenever something don't go their way or when something goes wrong at work, when we bomb a test, anybody can sit there with their arms crossed and pout. Anybody can do that. But if they do not see... The, uh, the difference in you, then they'll not see the difference. Uh, they will not see the reason they need to be saved. Uh, on to our second uh, part of this uh, 
in First uh, Thessalonians four, verse seven. First Thessalonians chapter four and verse number seven. And it goes along with uh, our, 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 our previous verse here. For God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. And uh, go ahead and turn to Second Corinthians chapter six. Be starting in verse number 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what hath concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what, hath, what part hath he that believeth with the infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For either the temple of the living God... As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out, among, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And this goes back to what I'm saying, or what I was saying earlier. God calls us to be holy. God is calling us out from the world. Uh, a lot of these uh, contemporary liberal churches today, they see nothing wrong with a person coming in off the street uh, clothed skimply, if I could word it that way. They see nothing wrong with a person dressing in modestly in the church. Could I say uh, that sin still puts a frown on God's face? Sin will still take the, uh, the, the power of God from our churches. We wonder why we don't have revivals anymore like we used to. We wonder why the, uh, it seems like people come to church and they leave the same way they walked in. Could I say it's because that we left the basic principles of God's Word? We left the basic, the basic knowledge that everybody used to learn in Sunday school. The, uh, um, everybody, when I was little, used to be able to quote John 3.16. And it, it was really surprising to me this past year whenever we got a couple new students and they was uh, asked to quote John 3.16 in our school and they couldn't. It made me sit back and look and uh, really consider this. What am I doing wrong? What is our, what is our school system? Uh, we go to a Christian school. Our school identifies as a Christian school. We use the Becker curriculum. Uh, which uses the King James Bible, and I'm, I, I'm thankful for that. But what are we doing wrong that a, a person could come to our school and not even know John 3.16? That used to be common knowledge. That used to be one of the basic things in the Bible, to know that God loved them, and there was a way uh, for them to be saved. That used to be the first thing we hit them with. And now it's, it's gone. It's gone from our churches. Gone from our schools. So we say, come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Uh, and um, later on in that uh, book, the Bible says to abstain from the very appearance of evil. That's another thing today that I believe has happened to our churches. Another thing that's happened to our churches is I believe we've gotten comfortable with sin. Not only have we left the basic principles of God's word, not, not only have we, uh, we, we're forgetting the basics, but we're getting comfortable with it. We're no longer seeing the urgency for lost souls to be saved. We're no longer, uh, when a lost person does get saved, we're no longer uh, putting them through discipleship classes and going out on everyday visitation so they can see what they got saved from. Because it'll be real easy for a person to forget that, and that is that is the first step for them to be uh, to start backsliding, to get cold, is to forget where they were saved from. If you turn with me to Second uh, Timothy chapter one, talking about the calling of God 
on a saved person. Once again, if you'll look in uh, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 9. If you look here, you'll see, again, the word holy. The Bible says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. I'm telling you this uh, tonight, this word holy is important. We got to get back to Christians living like Christians. And that word Christian means Christ-like. That means whenever somebody looks at us, we, we shouldn't even have to tell them we're Christian. We shouldn't have to even tell them that we're associated with any kind of religion. Just the way we walk in our everyday lives ought to point to him. And we'll get to that later, giving glory to God. But just the way that we walk and the way that we talk, that we should be so, we see here, for his purpose and his grace. His grace ought to be so on us. We ought to be talking about it all the time. We ought to be sharing it with others, telling them, hey, this grace ain't just for me, it's for you too. The grace that changed me, the grace that saved me from a eternal damnation will do the same for you. And that's the mindset that we should have the boldness to tell others about Jesus Christ. So we, we seem to we need to be holy. We need to be separate. We need to get back to the basics. And we uh, over here in First uh, Thessalonians again, chapter five. Verse number twenty four. The Bible said, faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. You see here, God calls a Christian. He has a particular work for a Christian to do. And uh, uh, to be holy and to be separate. And see, sometimes it may feel like you're the only one standing up. But can I tell you you're not? Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And it, you may be the only physical person standing up at that time, but I would hold, I would much rather have God standing by my side with me standing for what's right than to have ten people standing with me for something wrong. Go to our uh, second point. That was just minor points. <laughs> but uh, to our second point, we're called to uh, have a witness. A part of the job description for a Christian is to have a witness. In uh, Mark chapter number 16, I told you to keep the Bible close. We're going to be using it a lot. Mark chapter number 16, verse 15. When I teach Sunday school, or when I used to teach Sunday school, I had a, a friendly critic. She's not here tonight. I don't know where she's at. But um, Stephanie. She used to uh, get on me the whole time. Man, you're making us turn too much. We're going to be turning a bunch more, so get ready. All right, um, Mark chapter number 16, verse number 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So we see here, once again, the urgency. The Bible says, He that believeth not shall be damned. And uh, if you, in, a, in a later reference, I'll show you where that gets pinned on us. Um, you see, every person that walks past you in a day, if you do not ask them or make sure that they're on their way to heaven, that's partially your fault. And it's a very sobering thought. All the people that I come in contact with a day, there's at least 150 uh, people in our school on a given day. All of those people I come in that contact with at some point during that day, how many have I witnessed to? Sadly, none. Now, that's where our, 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 our living holy and being separate, they know what I stand for. But have I personally went up to them and asked, 
If you died right now, do you know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior and that you go to heaven? And that, that is our responsibility. And we should have that mind of Christ to constantly be on the, uh, on the train uh, or, or on the track of others. Constantly thinking about what if this person right here beside me were to die today? Well, and and it's a, like I said, it's a very sobering thought. But that, that's, that's our job as a Christian. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everybody, black, white, yellow, Mexican. No jokes there. <laughs> I had to do that. I'm sorry. Anyway, it doesn't matter what race or ethnicity you are. The fact of the matter is the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So it doesn't matter who they are. It's us that's prejudiced, not God. We might think, oh, he's a drug, a drug addict. He's got uh, tattoos all over his body. But Jesus' blood can still take his sin away. He can still end up in a place called heaven. The Bible says we'll be perfect in heaven. This mortal shall put on immortality. So in heaven, his tattoos will be gone. Turn me, if you will, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. We won't focus too much on this other than when you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, it'll be a whole lot easier than doing it in your flesh because your flesh says, oh, I'll get embarrassed. There's people around. They'll think I'm a nut. They'll think I'm crazy. But does the Bible not say that we're supposed to be a peculiar people, zealous unto good works? So uh, uh, on to the next one because I have plenty more and I've, I'm, I'm going to be here all night if I keep going. So I'm going to have to skip over some. Um, let's go to Ezekiel chapter number 33. Ezekiel is right before Daniel. Ezekiel chapter number 33 and verse number 6. And this is what I'm talking about. And this verse really struck me good. The Bible says, But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. You see here, we, see a, we have a picture of a, a watchman in the city on, uh, uh, standing in the watchtower. And the Bible paints the picture describing as if he sees an enemy coming but doesn't sound the alarm. And the Bible says that the blood will be on his hands. I will require the blood on his hands. So let's paint that a picture now. There's people all around us every day. Could even be sitting on a church pew right now, right in here, on a Wednesday night. There could be somebody right here they don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They're going through the motions. Uh, they, they put on a show. They put on that mask, as the preacher preached on a while back. They put on the mask to come to church. They come to church because they know it's a good thing. But if we don't warn them, their blood's on our hands. No, there's not a physical enemy out there waiting to kill them. But there is an enemy waiting to drag them straight down to hell. And what a, what a sad thought. Uh, I know I have, I have family on my daddy's side. And I have a cousin that I talk to every chance I get a chance to. And I couldn't tell you right now, if he, if he died right now, I don't know if he'd go to heaven or not. We have an urgency, folks. What about your lost loved ones? It could be one day, uh, the Bible says we're not promised tomorrow. One day too late would send somebody straight to hell. You say, something in your head keeps pushing you off. Oh, I'll tell them tomorrow. I'll talk to them tomorrow. It'll be more convenient tomorrow. Tomorrow will be less busy. One day too late will send them straight to hell. Next, see, giving glory to God. The next job of a Christian is giving glory to God. 
And um, I'll just, I won't make a turn here. The Bible says, uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31, Whatsoever you eat uh, or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I do want you to turn to Psalm 115 with me real quick. Psalm 115, chapter number, uh, Psalm 115, verse number one. <laughs> the Bible says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. That's one thing that we have to realize as a Christian about giving God glory is that it has nothing to do with us. Uh, we couldn't save ourselves on our own. If we was left up to ourselves, we ought to be in hell right now. Everybody knows that. But the fact of the matter is, they got to see that you mean it. It's easy for me to stand right here in front of the pulpit, in front of probably a good 30 people, 40 people, and say that this is not me, this is God. But it'd be a whole lot harder tomorrow when I go to the school. And I have to, I have to put that into practice. It'd be a whole lot easier for me to go tomorrow to school and say, "Look what I did," and take and rob all the glory from God. And I, I taught a Sunday school lesson a while back for last year, sometime about Herod. The Bible said, "And God took him, for He gave not God the glory." And that's in Acts. Now, what, what a serious thought that that is. That one slip up. One thing you one thing you rob in God glory could take that one uh, the, where the Holy Spirit's working and, and flip it around, ruin it. That one time that you say, "Well, I did this," God had no part of it. The one time you put the most confidence in the flesh, your life's in God's hands. And so you see, we get, our job is to give God glory, and uh, that next is to serve. In uh, John chapter number 12, I'll give you a couple minutes to get there. John chapter number 12. I hope I'm helping you tonight. I hope you're getting this. John chapter 12, verse number 26, when everybody gets there. John chapter 12, verse number 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall he also, or there shall also my servant be. If any man honor me, him, or yeah, if any man serve me, him will my father honor. So we see, uh, it does a great deal for us. Not down here. The Bible says, "Lay not up your treasures in earth, where moss and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal." But lay for yourselves treasures in heaven. Uh, it, gra- it gains us a great deal in the eyes of God for us to serve Him. To serve Him with a whole heart. To serve Him with everything we got. The Bible says, whatever, whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. So in serving, whatever, whatever works we reap from somebody else, the honor and credit, excuse me, goes straight to Him. Uh, turn here, and, uh, or I won't turn here. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The, uh, the, the principle or the, the meaning, the purpose, even behind studying your Bible every day, is so that you can be a workman. You can go out there, the Bible says the fields are by, already right in the harvest. If somebody came to you today, all right, on the way home, maybe you got to stop at the gas station. Who knows? If you have to make a stop today and uh, someone has asked you, uh, hey, well, did you go to church today? You look all dressed up. You say, yes, I did. Can you tell me about this Jesus? Can you tell me how to be saved? I've heard about him, but I don't know how. Would you be able to take him through it? As of two years ago, I probably couldn't. As of two years ago, I, I, and it, I've been in church my whole life, so this is this is not a testament to uh, uh, this is not anyone else's fault but mine. 
been in church my whole life, been in Sunday school my whole life, I've heard the gospel message my whole life. But as of two years ago, if someone were to ask me on individually if uh, they, if I could show them how to be saved, I probably couldn't have done it. And that is that is that is a shame on most Christians today. That whenever somebody asks if they can be saved, maybe they're too nervous to go forward to the preacher. Maybe they're comfortable with you telling them. And but most people will send them, "Oh, go talk to the preacher. Go talk to the Sunday school teacher." And there's nothing wrong with that if you don't know. But it could be that that one person, they're more comfortable with you than they are with the preacher, uh, for whatever reason that is. But that, it, it's an opportunity for God to use you as a tool. And whether you're ready to be used or not, that, that's going to make the difference. So see here, we need to give, uh, give glory to God, and we need to serve. Next thing is... um. Colossians chapter number 3, verse 24. You don't have to turn there. I'll turn there for you. Colossians 3, 24. Uh, let's start verse 23. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of, an, of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So we see here we, we get a reward. And this reward is worth it, by the way. I forget what the preacher uh, said. I forget the exact distances, but it covers probably a little more than half of the United States heaven does. I, I'm telling you, uh, most the average lifespan now is about 85 years. 80, 85 years is about the projected life uh, span. So what's, let's say you get saved. All right, say so I get saved when I did. I got saved at uh, 2014, so I'd be 11. So, easy math. 69 years? What is 69 ser uh, years of service uh, compared to an eternity in heaven? I mean, God has made it so good for us. Though it may not seem like it down here, if we just keep our eye on the real goal. Paul said, I press high toward the prize of the, uh, a high calling of God. If we just keep our eye focused on the target. I, um, I had a bad habit when I was a little kid. I went to my uncle's house, and we'd, we'd shoot guns, 20 gauges. And I'd always have a bad habit of getting lucky. Because with a shotgun and everything, you know, I wasn't used to recoil. So I'd always close my eyes. But I'd always hit my target. So, so I would, I, I, one of those things as a little kid, uh, we was shooting at a goose. And, uh, of course, everybody else checking out uh, for whatever reason. I don't know. It was a new gun, something like that. I don't know. But I said, me the daredevil I'm being, or, or I was at the time, still am. Uh, I said, Uncle Danny, I'll, I'll shoot the thing. I'll shoot it. So I threw it up there, closed my eyes, pow, looked up, and that bird's flopping around. I said, I hit it, I hit it, I hit it. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the fact is, it would have been dead if I'd just kept my eye on it. I, yes, I hit it. But it, it, the results would have been a whole lot better if I'd have just kept my eye on it. If I'd have just kept my eyes open on the target. Uh, so many times as Christians, we, we, we get caught up like Peter did in the storm. We, we look at everything but the main thing we should be focused on, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, we stay in church, we, we stay coming to activities and stuff, but imagine how better the results would be if our heart and mind was in it. Imagine how much better it would be. Yes, the attendance is here because you're here, but imagine if your sole focus was steady focused on that and you brought everything instead of just bringing you. Yeah, if you don't get what I'm saying... There used to be a time, Daddy told me, uh, back before camp meeting, whenever we was fixing up on the old bus back here, this church used to bring 277 passenger bus, 277 passenger buses to Bible school. That's not, that's not included our kids, the kids that were here. 277 passenger buses full of kids for Bible school. I, I can't help but compare that to what we had this year. And to see the decline and the, and the numbers going down, 
But there's no time. There's no time to play the shame game now. It's too late for that. It's, it's over. It's gone. What we have to do now is get our, our our eyes focused back to the target. Going out, winning, uh, going soul winning again. Getting a visitation program going again. Getting uh, five, ten men who will go in there every morning, uh, every time before service and pray. And uh, like I said, there's no time to play the shame game now. It's just to get back to where we left off. The fact of coming before God, getting clean with God, getting back to the basic principles of God's word, and just doing our job again. When um, the Lord purchased us with his blood, with his body, he paid the ultimate price for us. I, I, I heard this question, and I'm going to pose it to you. Is he getting what he paid for? Does he have all of you, or does he have a section of you? So we see here uh, in closing, how are we doing our job? How well are we doing our job? If you look in uh, Matthew chapter 25, I won't turn there, I won't read, but I'll give you the story behind it. Matthew chapter 25, there is three servants. Uh, and the Lord, uh, the Lord of the servants gives, him, or gives them uh, uh, talents of gold. He gave one a certain amount, so one a certain amount, and gave the other a certain amount. Two of the servants did what they were supposed to. They did their job. And they went out and they, uh, they, uh, they uh, basically brought more money in, brought revenue in, which is what he was expecting. But the, the other servant, he went and buried him in the field. Didn't do nothing with it because I guess he was afraid he was going to lose it. And when, they come, when it come back for the day for them to, excuse me, when it come back for them today to present what they their work to the master, the, the two that did what they were supposed to do, they got a job well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. And but when they come to the third servant, the one that buried in the field, thou slothful servant. I can't help but uh, picture the same scene in heaven as uh, we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And um, we present what God has given to us. Will you get a job well done? Have we stayed faithful enough? Have we, uh, um, have we done that which he has called us to do? And um, we go uh, over here, Hebrews 9.27 uh, as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. There is a judgment day. Uh, the, there is a day when everything that we've said and everything that we've done will be presented before God and every saved person. My prayer is tonight that this, this message will be, it will be uh, a wake-up call, if you will. A wake-up call to to correct our ways, to get back to the basic principles of God's word so that when we stand at that judgment day, we'll, it'll be no, there'll be no doubt in our mind. Paul said, I've fought a good fight, I've kept the course, I've finished my race. That we could have that assurity and that confidence that, hey, I was faithful, I, I finished my course. I did that which God called me to do. So um, how, do, how are we going to fix this? How do we come out of this comfortable condition that we're in? First of all, we must have a vision, as uh, Proverbs 29, 18 says. Without a vision, the people perish. Secondly, we must choose every day. And every day. Every day when we wake up in the morning, the first thing we should do, Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, give me an opportunity today to serve you. And, and, and mean it with all sincerity. Sure, there's going to be bad days. Sure. But every day, Joshua 24, 15, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Uh, and we must, uh, must give them our all in uh, Romans chapter uh, 12, verse number 1. Uh, I can't quote that one off my head. That's bad to me. But I'll turn here real quick for you. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So uh, we see here we got to give them our all. We got to give them everything we got. Then we see here uh, we must uh, never get comfortable. 
Never get comfortable. Never get comfortable. Uh, we get slowly exposed to sin. This slowly creeps in. And we get, we get so, uh, the best word I come up with right now is immune to it. We get so immune to sin that it's, it's part of our everyday lives. So we can't get comfortable and we can't give up. And uh, Psalm 31, number 4, verse 4. And like I said, I'll, I'll just flip over here and read this real quick. Y'all don't have to turn there. Psalm chapter number 31, verse 4. Ooh, that's not what I wanted. Anyway. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then, in uh, Hebrews chapter 13, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't use this one. But he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And, and in that time that you uh, you think that you, you, you're standing by yourself, that there's nobody else for you, Elijah was in that same spot. But what he didn't know is God had a, had a man that was storing a few extra men were just waiting for the right time to come out. So if you'll just stick right there with it. Uh, Nehemiah is another example that I, I, comes to mind. He, so all the opposition that he had from all of his enemies, that, ball, that wall still got built. Every man did his job. The Bible says some was, some was working on the wall, had the tools in one hand and the sword in the other. Then there was ones behind them with shields and, and spears. Everybody doing their job made that job a whole lot easier. And could I say here tonight, uh, this is the cream of the crop. You're probably saying, well, this doesn't apply to me. But could I say, if, if you'll just get out of your comfortable state and start doing your job, whatever the Lord's called you to do, whatever that is, whatever that may be, if you'll just do it, the job will run a whole lot smoother and you'll see this church grow like crazy. Guarantee we get back on fire for God again if we start praying before every service again. And not just before every service, because if you wait till before the service to pray for the power of God on that service, you've waited too late. So getting a daily practice of every day at home in your, in your private prayer time, in your private Bible study, just getting in the Word of God and, and learning all you can, getting back to the basic principles, it won't, it won't hurt you every once in a while to go read First Thessalonians chapter 5. It won't. And it, it won't hurt you every day to spend a couple hours in prayer. As most people say that, man, that's way too long. That's way too long. But if we're supposed to give God 10% of all our increase, according to the Old Testament, as far as the tithe, just think, um, anybody a math scholar in here, y'all can come up with this in a minute. 24 times 7? Anybody? Anyway, that's a whole bunch. And I promise you, or even if we do 24 hours a day, 10%, a couple hours, that ain't even 10% of your time. The Bible says 10% of all our increase. So we have, an, uh, we have a very increased amount of time with the, the, with the modern technology today. So just getting, uh, the, the main points of this message is getting back to the basics. Fulfill that which God called you to do. Uh, be a witness. Don't live like the world. If, we, if you got saved to live like the world, then what was the point in getting saved? Honest. If we got saved to live like the world, if we got saved to live like what we did before we got saved, what was the point in getting saved? And then we got to win others. We got to have a witness. We got to win others. We got to give glory to God so that others will get it. And then we, we got to get prepared to die, get prepared for the judgment, get prepared to uh, go before God. So, uh, how are we doing tonight, church? On a scale. Of all the things that I showed you in the Bible tonight, how are we doing? Uh, and I, I compare my life with this personally. I think I'm missing the mark a little bit. I think we all are as a church missing the mark a little bit. So uh, with every uh, head bowed and every eye closed, maybe tonight something I said has uh, just sparked a trigger in your, in your soul. Maybe... Maybe, maybe you got a, a burden for something. What's God calling you to do? If uh, the Lord spoke to you, I'm fixing to pray. The Lord spoke to you. How about come and do business with God? Lord, thanks for today's giving us, Lord. Thank you for this time that you've given us. Thank you for helping me to speak tonight, Lord.
Lord, I hope it wasn't boring. Lord, I hope it all made sense. And Lord, I hope it spoke to somebody. Lord, I've given that what you've given me, or given me, Lord. So Lord, I ask you to just take it and use it, Lord. Uh, help it to speak to them like it spoke to me while studying. In Jesus' name, amen. Altars open. We only got a little bit of time left. Paul thought Jesus was coming in his day. How much more closer is it now? There's that urgency I was talking about. Several hundred people die every day. It could be up to you whether they die and go to heaven or hell. I don't know about you, Christian Finn, but I vowed to give God everything I've got. But everything I've got will, won't amount to nothing. I need some people who will stand, stand with me. We need a church that will stand together. Stand for what the Bible says one more time. Y'all can look up now. <laughs> Ooh. Instant relief, I tell you. Mr. Brian, you have anything else you'd like to say? Anything you'd like to add? All hearts and minds clear? Somebody needs to give a word of testimony. I feel it. Somebody, quick. There you go, Brother Jeff. Glory to God. Anybody else? Anybody else before we dismiss? All right. Uh, Brother Sam, would you close us in a word of prayer, please?